the second week of our series, The Christmas Story, and the final J High service of 2014. Sad day, is it true? Uh, if you've grown up at church, uh, you may have heard this story before, but many times when we hear stories repeated, uh, we begin to take them for granted without really considering them. So my hope is that uh, this Christmas season, through this series, you all take time from all the business to slow down and really think about what Christmas is really all about. Uh, this week, our message is titled, The Christmas Story, Part 2. If you was here last week for Part 1, okay? So, a real quick recap. Part 1, if you weren't here, uh, we talked about uh, how the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary, who wasn't much older than you guys, and said, you're going to have a baby. And she goes, how can this be on a virgin? He goes, because this baby's not going to be like other babies. This is the Son of God. And how the night Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he wasn't born. How we would have planned the Son of God to be born. He was basically born in a barn with animals around him. And the first people that God chose to tell about his son being born on earth. The most central point in all of history. The most important day in all of history. The central event in history. The first people told were essentially the homeless of their day. The shepherds. Not exactly how we do. And through that, through our message last week, we learned that God's ways are not our ways. God's way of doing things are not our way of doing things. So when things happen in your life, you're like, why did God allow this to happen? I don't understand it. Right. And you start to understand God a little better. Because His ways of doing things is not our ways. All right. Uh, we're going to jump right back into the story. We're picking it up in a different uh, book, a different gospel uh, this week. Last week we were in Luke. Uh, this week we are in Matthew. So write it down. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So after you wrote that down, follow on the screen. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And some of you are like, wait, what? King Herod? Aren't the Romans in charge? Uh, king Herod was actually a Jew. Uh, he was the Jewish king, the king of the Jews. But he was a puppet uh, king for the Roman government. He basically represented the Roman emperor to appease the Jews. They put a leader of their own, one of their own, a Jew, in place. But he was basically more Roman than Jew. So that's who King Herod was. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this was everyone in Jerusalem. Pause there. Why was he disturbed? Who's the king of the Jews at this point? Herod is king of the Jews. So he just said, we've come to worship the new king of the Jews. And Herod's like, uh, I didn't just have a son born. What? That's why he's concerned. Uh, he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said. For this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was born. What does it say? No, where he was. And does it say, now last week we talked about the birth of Jesus, the night he was born, the first Christmas. And uh, we read in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, that it said that, uh, that the angels appeared to the, to the shepherds. They said, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, right. Can an adult buy a manger? No. Can a middle-aged child, a 10-year-old buy a manger? No. What did the angel tell these shepherds to look for? A what? A baby. It actually said that. We read it in Luke. It said a baby. The original Greek word was for an infant. A baby. Is that the word we see here in Matthew? 
What word do we see instead of baby? Child. Uh, this is an actual Greek term in the original. Uh, the, the original language that the uh, New Testament was written in was Greek, Koine Greek. And the word is for, not infant, but for a toddler. That's the, that's the word. Uh, what? Um, over the last couple years, we've shown a clip from a movie called The Nativity Story. Has anyone seen it before? The Nativity Story, have you seen that? A pretty good movie. Um, there's a scene in it, though, where the night Jesus was born, uh, the shepherds come. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's biblical. Yeah. The night Jesus was born, and there, there's, there they are. there's Mary, Joseph, and the baby in, in the stable. Yeah, okay, that's accurate. And then who shows up a little bit after the uh, shepherds? You know the story. Who shows up that same night? The wise men, right? Come, they come in on their camels and they get off the camels, right? right? Same night, and it's just all coordinated nicely, like for a nice Hollywood script, right? Um, the Bible here is basically debunking the famous myth of, Christ, of the Christmas story, the night Jesus was born. It's a myth. Uh, the Bible very clearly says, uh, no, the wise men missed the night he was born. They missed his birth. They were not there on the first Christmas. Uh, so yeah, they're stopping over the place where the child was. It gets even more interesting. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. So they entered the stable? House. House? Oh, they must be back in Nazareth at their regular house, right? So they're... No, what city are they in? Wait, they're still in Bethlehem. What? There's a, they're in a house? Where are they in a house? Now, why were they, we learned last week, uh, why was Jesus born in a stable? Because there was no room for him in the inn, hotel, right? There was no room. So wait, now they have a house? Where they get a house? This isn't the story I remember. Somebody freaking out, because their minds are blowing right, mind blowing right now, like, wait, what? The wise men weren't there the night he was born, like the movie says, what? Uh, but no, we're seeing very clearly something else here, very clearly. Uh, they entered the house, not in the stable anymore. Um, some scholars believe that uh, the reason that we see that Jesus is not an infant anymore, because how old now? What is, what's the Greek word basically for a little, little child, toddler? So Jesus could be anywhere between one and two years old. Uh, he's toddling around now. Uh, wait, why did they stay? Now, where are, they, where are Mary and Joseph from? What's their hometown? Where are they from? They live in Nazareth. Way up in the north in the Galilean desert, not in Judea, next to Jerusalem, which is where Bethlehem is. So what the, why are they, why are they still in Bethlehem if they're not, that's not their, where they live. They were just going back there for the census. Why are they still there? Because the trek back from Bethlehem to Nazareth was very dangerous through the desert. Very dangerous, especially for a little infant. So this kind of makes common sense. Log it makes, it's logical that Mary and Joseph would wait till little Jesus, the infant that we learned about in the first Christmas, would grow up to be big enough and strong enough and healthy enough to handle the trek uh, back into the North Galilean desert into Nazareth. It was a very long, dangerous journey, perilous journey. So they stayed. And so whose house is this? Did, did Joseph build a house that they lived in just for two years? Did, did he build a new house? Did they rent a house? Did they buy a new house for just two years? Would they do that? Um, probably not. Probably not. Uh, we learned last week, uh, even though uh, Mary and Joseph themselves were actually from... What town? Where, they, where, where was their hometown? Nazareth. Thank you. Let's make sure we know this. Nazareth. Remember, Nazareth equals Kent. Not the nicest place. <laughs> That's what we talked about last week. Uh, Nazareth. They're from Nazareth. But where is Joseph's family from originally going back generations? Bethlehem. That's why they had to go to Bethlehem in the first place, because that's where the line, their, their family was originally from, from Joseph's family. His, his, his relatives were originally from there. His people were from there. Like we said last week, how many of you are not from, you weren't born in Washington? <laughs> okay, yeah. But your home now is Seattle, right? You're in the Seattle family, right? But where's your family originally from? California, Texas, Canada? All right. Uh, yeah. It's the same thing. So they didn't actually live in Bethlehem. They're just going back there for this Roman census. The Roman government required that they go back to the place that their families are from. So if you're from Texas or California, your family would have to go back there to do the census. Make sense? Cool. So they stayed there because it was a dangerous trip back north. That makes sense. But Joseph's relatives are from Bethlehem. Now, these probably aren't really close relatives. These could be really distant cousins, twice removed on his mother's side. I don't know. Um, maybe he hasn't seen these people for years. 
Um, but he probably has some distant relatives that still live in Bethlehem. And that's probably who they're staying with. And then we're reading about it. That's whose house it probably is. They're just staying with probably Joseph's relatives. Um, so they saw the child with his mother, Mary. So they're going into the house, still in Bethlehem, in the house. No infant Jesus anymore, right? So they go in the house. Up comes little cute toddler Jesus. He's walking now. Wow, look at, this is crazy. Boy, my life. And he's playing with his little toys, and he comes walking out, walking out. They're like, where's, where's the baby? Well, he's not a baby anymore. He's, he's a toddler. Um, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. What? Who's missing? Who's missing? Who's missing from our nativity scene? You guys got your nativity scenes? I don't know. Who's missing from this? Where's Joseph? Where is he? From the Bible? It appears that Joseph missed the wise men. He wasn't there. He didn't get to meet him. He didn't see him. These amazing travelers from this far exotic land, from the per from Persia, they come. They get these. They have these huge uh, treasure chests, and Joseph misses the whole thing. So we're like, is he dead? No, 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 no. He dies later. We know he probably he dies before Mary dies. We know that. But uh, no, he's still alive because we hear about Joseph again when Jesus is twelve years old, when he's uh, teaching in the temple. Joseph's still alive, but where is he? Well, he's, if, he's, if they're staying with somebody, he's probably having to work for their rent. And so he's probably having to help his relatives. Maybe he's with his cousin or his uncle out in the uh, Judean wilderness cutting trees down or something for work. He's, he's working. He's, he's out for the day. And here come the wise men. <laughs> and he missed them. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Now, get this in your you got little cute toddler Jesus, put down his toys, and Mary's like, come on. And Jesus comes walking over, and these really exotic uh, men from the Far East, from, from the Persian Empire, they've never seen people with these fine robes and these wealthy, these amazing, educated guys. And these guys bow face down before this cute little toddler. Powerful image. Then they opened their treasure chests. And gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those of us who have seen the movies, they'd set those little, like, little canisters like in front of them. Here you go, little box. No, this doesn't sound like little boxes according to the Bible. Then they opened their what? Their treasure chests. They brought a lot of wealth with them. It's not like the movies. There's a lot. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Because we read later that Herod had designs to kill little toddler Jesus. And uh, the King Herod, uh, he's known in history as Herod the Great. He actually helped rebuild the Jews' temple uh, in, in Jerusalem. And even though he worked for the Romans, he tried to appease the Jews at the same time, his people. Uh, he's known as Herod the Great because he built all these amazing buildings, all these amazing cities. Uh, but he was a tyrant, we read in the Bible. See, there was an evil side to Herod. And uh, he went down, we read in the next uh, few chapters, that uh, Herod, King Herod, uh, went down as one of the most evil kings, the most evil rulers in world history, because of one act he did, one extremely evil act. It's known as, through history, has become known as the slaughter of the innocents. Because what he did after this is because he thought, saw Jesus as a threat. Even though his people, the Jews, have been waiting for this Messiah, this new king to come for centuries, he decided that, even though he was Jewish, his power through Rome was more important to him than his own religion. And he decided to kill this Messiah. And to make sure that he did kill them, he decided and decreed and sent his soldiers to Bethlehem to murder every two-year-old boy and under, from every infant boy to a two-year-old, he murdered every one of the boys in Bethlehem just after this happened. Evil, evil person for power, to hold on to power. Um, obviously, God was going to protect his son, and so he told, had an angel tell uh, Joseph in a dream to take uh, Mary and Jesus down to Egypt and wait for Herod to die, which is what they did. So uh, little Jesus grew up, little toddler Jesus grew up as a little boy in Egypt, actually. So you're like, what? That's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's the, that's the actual true Christmas story. Um, so let's go back to the wise men. Who were the wise men? That's number one, write down. Who were the wise men? Well, they were likely educated astronomers, highly educated astronomers, known as magi from Persia, modern day Iran. They're not kings. It's a myth. They are not kings. You've heard the story of We Three Kings, right? right? Uh, no, they're not kings. The Bible never says they're kings. They're highly educated astronomers. Astronomers are people who study the stars. 
Uh, it was customary 2,000 years ago that foreign ambassadors would bring gifts to gain the favor of royalty, especially during royal births. Uh, this makes sense. They're representing some royal family from the, uh, out from the now overthrown Persian Empire. Uh, and so they're in a court. They work for the Persian king. And they're coming to represent him and bringing greetings. Uh, very wealthy. And why would you do this back then in the ancient world? Uh, this is how wars are avoided. Um, you're, much like, le you're much less likely to go to war with that kingdom, your neighboring kingdom that's next to you, the other kingdom, uh, if they brought your newborn son, the prince, if they brought him gifts when he's born. Yeah, they were really nice to my son when he was born. I don't think we'll go invade them this year. Uh, this is how wars are, avo are avoided. That's why they did it back then. And so, as astronomers, uh, they followed the star that God placed over them. Actually, it was a moving star. Some people have argued that, oh, it was a comet. You know, God couldn't move a star. We know that doesn't happen. If God wanted to move a star, could he move a star? Without the whole galaxy falling apart? Yeah, you bet you could. So some people are like, no, the whole, thing, the whole universe would implode if a star moved like that. Um, God holds, when you read the Bible, God holds the whole universe in his hand. So if he wants to move a star over a house, he can do it. And so, um, it took time though. They had to come from Persia. That's a long trek through the desert, through the Arabian desert. Uh, it took them a long time to get to Bethlehem. That's why they missed the night that Jesus was born. They had to come from a long, long way away. Could, they could have traveled for, for months and months and months. After logically going to the capital city of Jerusalem, uh, they were directed to Bethlehem, where they found Mary and worshipped the toddler Jesus, as we just talked about, as king of kings, inside the home where they were staying. The Magi presented Jesus with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And each of those gifts represented a message about who Jesus really was. He may look like an ordinary toddler, but he's not. Number two. So these gifts all have a symbol. So what did the gifts symbolize that were given to Jesus by the Magi? Uh, the gold signified Jesus' royalty as the king of kings. The greatest king to ever live. Um, last week we talked about uh, how the way Jesus was born is not how we would have had the Son of God be born. I mean, he's God. It's the most central point in all of history where God comes to earth to save us. He's born in a barn with animals around him? That's not how we would have done it. But we learned that God's ways are not our ways. We learned again by the first people that God decided to tell about Jesus' birth. This most important moment in all of history was shepherds, the uneducated class, the homeless of the day. That's who you choose to tell first, not the Roman governors, not the Jewish religious shepherds. What? We learned last week that God's ways are not our ways. A very, very humble beginning. But then we learned that through his life, uh, even from humble beginnings, we learned that the most powerful message ever given, the gospel of Jesus Christ, started very, very small and humble. But this is getting a little bit better. Now we're getting a little better. Because now, little toddler Jesus is rich. We're like, okay, this is getting a little better now. Not so humble anymore. Not so almost embarrassing anymore. Okay, this is the Son of God. Look at this, this little toddler Jesus is having these wise men bow down face to the facing the dirty floor before him, giving him tons of money. Yeah, this is more what Jesus deserves, the Son of God deserves. They're saying this is not a normal child. The next was frankincense. What's frankincense? Well, it was highly valued, expensive, and rare. Uh, the Jew Jewish people used it in the temple in Jerusalem during their worship of God. Uh, last year, when I was talking about it, I actually had a bit of frankincense on a stick, and I lit it, and the smoke rise to the ceiling. When the, and it smells really powerful, so some people like it, some people don't. So you're lucky I don't have it today. It will definitely affect your olfactory senses. Um, you'll be able to listen, see, and smell the service today. Um, and the smoke rise. And so that when they would use it in the Jewish religious service back then, they would sit, use it as a symbol to say, see, the smoke is rising to, to heaven, just like our prayers are rising to heaven. That's, what they, that's why they used it. And so uh, this gift of frankincense signified that Jesus was God. Points to his divinity. And the last gift, myrrh, was a very strange gift to present to a baby. It was very valuable, like frankincense, but it was most commonly used as perfume and for burial. 
An aggravated gift to give to a baby? What? Is that, you see how that's an odd gift to give to a baby? It's something you use on someone when they die. It would be placed on the burial cloths of a dead person to help cover the stench of death. The gift of myrrh signified that Jesus came to earth for one reason, to be sacrificed. I'm sure when Mary saw this gift come out, it pulled at her heart, and she made me start crying when she saw that gift presented. Because Mary knew why Jesus came. And he came for one reason and one reason alone, to die. Point number three, Jesus' life. After his miraculous birth, Jesus grew up a normal Jewish boy in backwards Nazareth, up in the Galilean desert. They went back to Nazareth, albeit one who never sinned. We learned last week because of the important theological concept that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. You have to believe that if you want to be a true Christian. That's a, that's a central tenet of our faith. Why? Because only someone born of a virgin could be born without a sin nature. Jesus was the only human ever born without the curse of Adam on him, the curse of the fall. Jesus did not have a sin nature. So he was a normal boy. He was 100% human. But he did not have a sin nature like the rest of us. So he was perfect. He followed his earthly father's humble occupation of carpentry until he was around 30. So Joseph was a carpenter, so Jesus became a carpenter. He helped Joseph. And for most of Jesus' life, he was a carpenter. He only did ministry, he only did miracles for three years. The rest of his life, he was a carpenter. Until the age of 30, when he started his three-year ministry. After recruiting a group of 12 disciples or followers who were mostly teenagers from unglamorous backgrounds, Jesus went on to perform countless miracles which proved he was who he claimed to be, God. Such as feeding thousands with just a few fish and loaves of bread, healing the legs of cripples, making blind men see, calming stormy seas, walking on water, and even bringing a dead man back to life. Jesus also taught many controversial things, such as loving your enemy. He hung out with sinners, and he didn't hate the Romans, as the Messiah was supposed to, as most Jewish people thought the Messiah would be. Their expectation of Messiah, their Savior, was that he would slaughter the hated Romans and expel them from their lands and restore the Jewish kingdom and become the new King David. That's what they wanted him to be. A political, a military leader. Yet, Jesus Christ didn't even dislike the Romans. In fact, he told the Jews to give to Caesar, the emperor, what is Caesar's? Pay your taxes to Rome is what Jesus said. That's the only political comment he ever made. That wasn't what Messiah was supposed to do. But it was, his, it was his repeated verbal attacks on the hypocritical Jewish religious leaders who he once called whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful and painted and lovely on the outside. You look like you got it all together. But on the inside, Jesus said to him, I can see your hearts. And they're as dark and twisted and rotten as anyone else. I see through your hypocrisy. And that would eventually lead to Jesus' death. After the last supper with his disciples, and we're going to commemorate that today with communion at the end of the service, Jesus was betrayed by his own disciple Judas and arrested by the Jewish religious leaders. After a corrupt trial, the Jewish leaders took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, demanding that he be crucified. Although Pilate knew Jesus was truly innocent, he greatly feared the Jewish leaders and the rebellion that they could incite. So Pilate ordered Jesus to be crucified. After having his back shredded by the Roman scourging, which wasn't a whipping, the, the tool they used was called a flagellum, and it had several tails coming out of it, and at the end were ball bearings, 
and sharp metal pieces, which were meant to pulverize, pulverize and remove the skin off your back. It was torture. And Jesus was beaten. Beaten beyond the point of recognition, Isaiah tells us in the Bible, that his friends couldn't even recognize him anymore. He was beaten so badly. And he had a crown of thorns forced onto his head. After all this, Jesus was nailed to a cross just outside the walls of Jerusalem for all to see. And he spent hours in torturous agony before he died. Some of you in here might be wondering, this is Christmas, we're supposed to be focusing on the manger and little baby Jesus. Why are we talking about Jesus' death like at Easter? Because a lot of times in our culture, even Christians forget why that baby came. See, a baby, even to non-Christians, is very inoffensive. That's not offensive at all, little sweet baby. Everybody can get behind that. That's why 90% of Americans celebrate Christmas today. Even though most of them are Christians. They go, hey, I can, I can get behind this little cute baby. But they don't want to talk about the reason that baby came. He came for one reason and one reason alone. And you're looking at it right now. See, Jesus came to earth as a baby the first Christmas so that he could die in our place as guilty sinners. So that we didn't have to be hung on crosses. Of course, the story doesn't end there. Three days later, on the first Easter, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead and offered us an opportunity to be saved. See, the number one problem in our world is sin. That's why Jesus had to come. And we cannot save ourselves. The number one problem is sin. I want you guys to understand that. It's not AIDS. It's not world hunger. It's not Ebola. No, the number one problem in the world today is sin. And the Bible tells us very clearly, sin cuts us off from God. We know we're all guilty. We have all sinned. The Bible makes this clear. But the penalty for being a guilty sinner, even though we're all in it, is heaven. It's death. It's eternal separation from God in hell for eternity. That's the truth. The Bible makes that clear. Jesus believed in hell. That's why I talk about hell and J.I. Jesus talked about it a lot. That he's like, this is why I came to save you from hell. But you see, God the Father loved you so much that he devised a great rescue plan. And he sent his only beloved son, Jesus, to be born as a human on the first Christmas. And Jesus literally became God with skin on 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. The story doesn't end there, though. A lot of people would prefer that we just stop there. Just talk about the baby. No, no, no. That baby came for one mission and one mission alone. He grew up, he lived a perfect, sinless life, he did all these amazing miracles, proving he was God, who he claimed to be. That's why they hung him on a cross, he said, I am God. And as an adult, Jesus chose to go to the cross. No one forced him, it was his choice and his choice alone. And as we look at it, he bled, he suffered, and he died for you. He loves you. On the third day, God the Father raised Jesus' the Son from the dead, defeating Satan and death once and for all, before ascending back to heaven, where 2,000 years later, Jesus he isn't dead anymore. He reigns in glory, and He is alive at the right hand of His Father in heaven in glory. And He wants each and every one of you to join Him there someday. But first, you need to take a step of faith. And not everyone in this room has done that. See, just going to church isn't that stuff of faith. Getting baptized or sprinkled with water is good. That's not that stuff of faith. 